Dr. Bo is uh, an emergency medicine and internal medicine doctor from Seattle, Washington. He received his degree from the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Science. Dr. Gloucester actively shows and breeds golden retrievers and Samoyeds or Samoyeds, depending on... Who's at the podium? <laughs> He has served in various task forces, including the American Veterinary Medical Association Task Force on Canine Aggression, and he also serves on the Grants Committee for the uh, Canine Health Foundation. Please give him a very warm welcome, and thank you. The canine has been domesticated for 12,000 years, and for the past 30 of those years, I've had the privilege and responsibility of practicing emergency medicine in a fairly busy downtown hospital in Seattle, Washington. Over those 30 years, I have taken care of a spectrum of illness and injury. <clears throat> I have taken care of people who have been terribly injured or terribly sick. I've had people run over by an engineer at Amtrak, run over by an Amtrak train. He came in the ambulance, his legs came in a cooler. I've taken care of people that have had significant crimes, rape, other things like that, and have had to testify in court. I have delivered babies in the ambulance bay driveway of the hospital. In terms of uh, probably emotional stresses, I've had circumstances in which I've gone into a trauma room to find a fairly injured automobile accident patient and find out that it was a friend of mine. I've taken care of multiple types of bites, gorillas, bats, dogs, cats, uh, humans, squirrels, raccoons, opossums, you name it. I've taken care of stings from urchins and anemones, bees and wasps. I can tell you this, nothing in the 30 years of emergency medicine caused me to develop a rapid heart rate or to break into a sweat other than the dog bite to a child being brought in by very agitated and upset parents. So get the scenario in your mind. The parents come in with a child who is badly injured or badly bitten, usually to the face. In addition to the usual and customary irritations with the emergency department, you know, the TV in the lobby is on the shopping network. The only thing to read are old issues of popular mechanics and boys' life. Glaring at the registration desk clerk doesn't get you into the department any more quickly. In addition to all that, these parents are in a situation in which they are angry. They're probably angry at one another. They are feeling extremely, extremely guilty. They are hysterical to some extent. They can't understand why it is that we don't have a plastic surgeon in the emergency department 24-7 just waiting for them. Uh, I'm not sure who would pay that hourly rate. Uh, and they're oftentimes upset with the neighbor, which may be the owner of the dog that bit. They're upset perhaps with one another because one of them should have been watching the child or the dog and uh, should have taken care of that. So I find myself in the circumstance of needing to establish some calm to take care of the emotional issues, to take care of the trauma issues, and to deal with this child who's badly bitten. That's one story. Make your own scenario. Multiply it by a thousand. And that is the number of bites that are seen in the emergency departments of this country every day. Multiply it by roughly 365. 380 to 400,000 bites are seen in the emergency department of this country in a year. Double that, because only about half of the bites go to the emergency department for care. Many of them go to, stand, uh, to freestanding clinics, call their doctor's office. They may be in a situation where there is a medical facility, whether it's a summer camp or things like that, that will take care of them. So now we're up to roughly 800,000 medically treated dog bites in this country every year. But let's multiply that one by five, because that is the factor that we would need to take account of the fact that only one in five dog bites ultimately seek medical care in any sense. So now we're dealing with a magnitude of four to five million dog bites in this country every single year. What are the costs of something like that? Well, you can do any math you want. 
you all know how expensive emergency departments are. So we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars of medical costs alone, let alone some other things that you need to, uh, to consider as well. In addition, the estimate is a billion dollars was spent by insurance companies in, I think, 1998 or 1999 in paying back to uh, different people home liability policies and coverage as a result. So billion dollars every year for that. And then take account of these costs that we really don't know. We just kind of assume them. Lost wages from someone not able to return to work, damage to property, damage to self, therapy costs for the years following for some, all those kind of things. And then in addition, there's all these kind of hidden costs that we don't entertain. Um, someone may not get bit, but may be knocked off a bicycle, for example, by a, a, a charging dog. So the bicycle's ruined, the clothing is ruined, and all these other things. So there's all these uh, terribly hidden costs that go on. So the problem is vast. Um, but let's break it down a little bit so we try to understand where the epidemiology of all this is occurring. Greater than uh, 60 to 70 percent of bites occur in children, but... But 42% of these bites occur to children less than 14 years of age. So it is the kids that really need to be targeted particularly for this. They're a bit less uh, responsive in some ways to the education that we can try and help them to prevent from dog bites, but that certainly is a target that we need to look at. The highest rate in, this, in that age group of under 14 is for boys, probably having to do with, you know, the gender bias probably has to do with how boys play. Um, I used to give a talk on electrical injuries, high voltage electrical injuries. That was a very, very predominant injury to boys because they're the ones who thought hanging on to high voltage tension wires just might be an interesting concept to try. <laughs> Girls were a little bit less uh, willing to do so. However, after age 14, it all neutralizes out. There is no longer a gender bias. It's happening to both sexes with the same, uh, with the same frequency. So it probably suggests that there's some gender bias at play in younger kids. Another interesting fact, approximately 50% of all children are bitten before they attain age 18. So if the problem is that vast and that huge, it also begs the question, why isn't there more reluctance and fear in children, particularly around animals? Well, I would contend this. Kids think of getting a dog bite much like they do falling off a bicycle. It's just something that happens. So unless it happens in a very critical way, a critical formative time, a very severe bite perhaps, most kids just let it go. It's the parents who typically tend to be a bit more um, upset by that. Uh, the peak is in the summer months, um, as would make sense. Kids are out more. Dogs are probably out more. Um, so the peak occurs from April to September, but particularly the summer months are very, very significant. Um, the severity of bites is much worse in the zero to four year old, you know, the real infant, uh, and up to four years of age. And then, less or so, and then once again, very severe in people over age 70. So at both, at both ends of the spectrum of aging, the severity of bites is uh, determined. Um, and the diagnoses that you see, and I've seen them all, I assure you, um, can be very, very simple. They can be as simple as a puncture wound, it can be very severe lacerations. Uh, they oftentimes um, just don't even break the skin, so what we call a contusion or abrasion or hematoma. Um, and so there is a, a tremendous spectrum of that. In children, in children, the predominance of bite occurs to the head and neck, which perhaps accounts, I believe, for why these bites are more severe or serious. In adults, they typically occur in greater fashion, 70 to 80 percent, to the extremities, typically the hand, wrist, or arm. Um, and I think all of you have seen situations or at least would intuitively understand why that would occur. Um, in terms of who's doing the biting, 30%, 40% occur um, from uh, the household dog. About 40% more to 50% more occur from the neighbor dog or, a, if you will, a known dog. So this emphasis or attention that's given to the wandering dog that's biting or these dogs that are just going out at random biting is incorrect. 80 to 90% of dog bites are inflicted by dogs known to the person who receives the bite in some connection. Um, 
why are they biting? Well, we all have our theories on that, and I think we all know that. We certainly look at what we call excused or justifiable bites, and we look at others. It may be fear, it may, and that can be fear biting, or it may be just really a, a perceived threat by the animal. Um, protection of territory, obviously, is a very, very common reason for that to occur. Um, the dog may be injured and I, or sick, and I would include in that the broad spectrum of injured animals. Anyone, any dog that's hurt, any dog that's sick, any dog that's aging should be thought of in a sense of being ill in the sense that the dog may be uncomfortable, slow moving, has, hasn't the ability to get out of the situation. So that fits into that spectrum as well. And of course things like uh, protection of the puppies and different things that I think we all look at as, uh, as causing that. The risk factors. What are the risk factors for a dog to bite? Well, first of all, I think I've implied the significant risk factor is you're a child. And the reason that that occurs is children are very, very different about dogs uh, and around them. Um, and they're very hard to intervene in and say, stop doing that. You, any, your parents know you can't stop your kid from screaming or running or being playful or hopping or whatever. And a dog obviously is going to misinterpret that. Uh, in many circumstances for a couple of reasons. The dog may not be raised around children, so all of a sudden it has this squealing, happy, jolly, running child, activates the prey drive, activates the fear, activates the protection or aggression. So that happens. Males, I've said, um, are bitten with a great more uh, frequency. Households with dogs. That sounds a little redundant. What I mean by that is if a person comes from a household with a dog, he or she is more likely to be bit by another dog because they are familiar with animals, they're friendly with animals, they're comfortable around them. Whereas if someone comes from a household that doesn't have a dog, they are a bit more reserved perhaps and are not as likely to go up to a strange dog and try and make friends and try and pet it, become friendly with it. So that's another factor that needs to be considered. Uh, uh, home location in his, meaning by that, that the dog is more likely to bite if it's in its home as opposed to on neutral territory, which gets back to what we were just saying about protection of territory as well. Um, and a leash dog is perhaps a risk in the sense that a leash dog can't get away from the situation. Now, I will make one point here that I'll be making in a, in a short bit as well that I want, to, I want to reiterate, and that is that there has been, in the reports of many fatalities, about 400 dog fatalities now, not bites. We're talking about the spectrum of dog caused deaths. There's only been one that I think has been reported that is caused by a restrained dog off its territory. Important concept because it gets to the, if you will, the very fabric of leash laws, why they're important, um, and the fact that dogs that are tarnished, or that are, are tethered, are, per, are in a sense in a protective mechanism or in a control mechanism. So that's very, very important. Um, in terms of what I'll get in. So, but a leash dog, in terms of not fatalities, but just biting now, is also a risk for that because they're the ones that, that uh, uh, can't get away. 97 to 90, give me a second, 97 to 98% of bites are uh, inflicted on family members or guests on their property. So there isn't this marauding group of dog packs out there that are doing the bulk of uh, all this damage. Um, let me talk about just a couple of things that have happened recently and, if you will, locally, and perhaps even more nationally that people are aware of so you can get a sense of it. It gets to how it is that we protect people from dog bites. I've mentioned, for example, the elderly, the people that are at great risk for dog bites. And it's, it's clear why they are, because they can't get away. They don't have the physical skill. Oftentimes, they don't have the reflexes. They don't have the speed. Many of you are perhaps familiar with a woman who was, I believe, in Bremerton who went to work. Her mother, mother was visiting. Mother went out into the yard with, I believe it was a family of bull mastiffs, but it was a couple of bull mastiffs or bull mastiff types, and she was killed. Daughter came home to find her uh, critically, lethally injured, uh, and ultimately she died. Um, there was um, a child, and I think this was in Federal Way, and again, this has been ascribed to a bull mastiff mix, but the breeds aren't important, as I'm sure others will talk about in a short bit. Um, and these were, parents had gone, this young child was in the care of its adolescent brother and friends. And they were tired of the kid. So we all get tired of eight-year-olds occasionally. So they sent this kid out into the yard with the dogs that were loose. And he was killed. Um, you're all um, aware of the recent event in Florida that got a lot of attention at a match or a show down in there. And before the truth of that could be established, it was out on the press in very hysterical terms about a woman whose foot had been chewed off by an Akita uh, at a match. 
Um, but having said all that, having said all that, there was a Yorkie that killed a child in Georgia. Just went up into the crib and killed the child. So let's talk about that for a second because these are the spectrums of age that we need to consider the young child and the older person. Part of the reason they die, by the way, is some of you may um, are old enough to remember William Holden, the television and movie actor, who died in his condo in uh, Hawaii when he passed out having been drinking and sustained a small laceration to his scalp and bled to death. And that's the reason that, uh, that these older people and younger kids have problems with sustaining uh, viability with these bad bites to the head because they don't have the ability that we in this audience have for the most part to, they, we lose the elasticity of our vessels as we age so these vessels don't retract. We keep bleeding and ultimately we bleed to death. A child has tremendous vascular supply uh, in its scalp and skull, and so they bleed to death very easily. Their skull, their skull rather, is very penetrable as well, but they bleed to death very easily from that. So that's uh, what happens. The caveat, however, and I think Dr. Beaver will probably allude to this as well, is over 30 breeds, at least, over 30 breeds of animals have been involved in dog fatalities. And if we look at the spectrum of dog bites, you very well know that every breed and every crossbreed has been involved in, uh, in those as well. So, how do we deal with this? What is it that we start to try and do? We need to realize that, and I think Patty Strand has even commented on that in, in other areas, and that is the difference between a proactive and a reactive stance. If we're starting, if our next move is to go to the Tacoma City Council and talk about a legislation that is against a certain breed of dog, uh, or a certain weight of dog, as was uh, recently touted in one of the Washington communities, then we're in a reactive mode. We're trying to deal with the hysteria after it's happened, after the genie, if you will, is out of the bottle. We need to put ourselves in a more proactive mode. And it was this that I think, that I believe led to Dr. Beavers chairing the uh, AVMA task force on canine aggression. Um, and it was in my involvement in emergency medicine as well as my appreciation of dogs that led to my sitting on that committee for a couple of years. And that was a specific attempt to target proactively community prevention of dog bites. How is it that we can deal with the magnitude of this problem? And how is it that individually each one of you could deal with that? Well, there will be or, or is now copies of this article that uh, uh, Patty and Nancy will put out, which is this, the community, uh, an approach to prevention of dog bites in communities. And I think if you look through that, some of it is a bit cut and dry and some of it is a bit saw perfect, but if you look through it, I think you'll find that there are certain things that you can do within your community to try and start addressing this problem. For example, some of you may be school nurses or friendly with school nurses. Some of you um, certainly can start dealing with people that are in your firm of construction, for example. I recently had someone working in my home out in the yard doing some work for me and looked out and was horrified because he had gone, he had just walked into the pen where I had my golden retriever. Well, I knew the dog wouldn't do anything. I knew that this, you know, it was the, it's the golden retriever. It has one mood. It's had it since he was, it's had it since he was eight weeks. Uh, he's had no other. I keep trying to see if there's anything else there. There's not. Uh, but he didn't know that. He didn't know that. And so this is what people do. And again, this probably fe feeds into the macho thing, but it also probably more likely is the fact that he had dogs, so he assumed dogs are fine. Uh, he knew me and he assumed I wouldn't have a nasty dog. Uh, but people do that. So the target audiences became very, very critical in this. Um, I have up here uh, on this slide a postal carrier uh, in cartoon fashion. This has been a very, very significant event in that the post office has markedly diminished the number of bites that it's had from a very, very aggressive training program to the uh, mail carriers and to providing them with you know, sprays and other things like that. But mo more importantly, they have the big stick. You want your mail? Control the dog. And so we need to find mechanisms that work to try and make people know that they need to be responsible for these issues or there are consequences to them for it. And it, and it can't be something vague like insurance premiums are going up or you know, medical care costs are going up. It needs to be much more specific than that. Let me harken back to that child coming into the emergency department because this becomes a lifelong quest and a lifelong commitment, I think, for all of us. That eight-year-old girl that comes in with the bite that I alluded to in the beginning of my talk, by the time 
those parents have been in the emergency department for several hours. They have already catapulted to her wedding. They are already thinking, what's going to be the nature of this? She's going to be so scarred walking down the aisle, stuff like that. This problem is vast. And unfortunately, I think for me, this is the time I would obviously be very, very motivated and have the opportunity to do some teaching. But the guilt level and the anger level is huge. So it puts me in a situation in which there is no room for proactivity. And all I can do is react. And I can't contribute to the guilt that already exists there. So we need to find a mechanism to get into these situations and try and prevent them earlier. You all know the common sense things that need to be done to tell people how to avoid dog bites. I won't get into them. We can talk about them uh, casually or other times. Um, but we need to, uh, to look at what it is that we're doing that is helpful in diminishing the magnitude of this problem. And the magnitude is critical. This is vast. Four to five million dog bites in this country every single year. Some incidents, just anecdotally. Um, many of you are perhaps great uh, fans of the off-leash areas. I happen not to be. I've taken care of too many in which the canines become locked in the collars, and you can't usually take the collars off the dogs in off-leash areas, so you've got this incredible setup for that. So you've got the dogs that are fighting, and you've got the owners trying to break it up. Right. And there's no mechanism around there to do that, and the dogs are locked. So that's one thing that needs to be looked at. The jogger and bicyclist I referred to, you all know, I think, those uh, circumstances. Or how about this one? Oh, my dogs are fighting. Let me stop them. I have a goddaughter. She's uh, really a very, very great person uh, uh, and has been one of these kind of animal lovers for all her life. Um, now has dogs, and I work with her. We have a vacation home with her parents, so we would work with her. We'd go up with our dogs. I would train her repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. Behavior around dogs, and my dogs were pretty well behaved, so I wasn't worried, but that became the great way to teach her. So I think, unfortunately, the lesson became lost, and the familiarity grew, because she decided to go to her neighbor's home, and her friend was holding the corgi in her arms. So she decided she would go up and snuggle the corgi. Bad idea. Bad idea. Um, dog show bites. Jane Anderson, former dog judge, perhaps future dog judge as well, goes down to examine a, a male dog. And the dog is thinking, you want to see if I have two what? <laughs> so there are circumstances that keep occurring all the time. Um, there are in this country 10 to 20 times as many dog bites as cat bites. 10 to 20 times as many dog bites as cat bites. But we win because you infect with about 20 times the rate that we infect. And the reason for that, by the way, is that dog bites tend to be shredding, macerating, lacerating kind of bites. Human bites tend to be very superficial, break of skin kind of stuff, but a cat bite. Think of it as a hypodermic with an inoculum of germs going into skin, out of skin, the skin closes, here's that little inoculum of germs. So you infect with much greater frequency, about 17%, uh, whereas we're down to about 1% or so. In terms of the uh, fatalities, uh, again, I think that the important take-home message of all that is we are down to 10 to 20 dog bite deaths, dog attack deaths, dog mauling deaths per year in this country. That has remained steady for the past 20 years or so. In fact, there's a study that I have out there as well looking at just dog bite deaths. I don't want to put that as my emphasis, but there is looking at dog bite deaths. And there's been no change in that number until, unfortunately, a suggestion that maybe last year there was a blip up to uh, 35 to 40. I don't know that that's clear yet. Maybe Bonnie will uh, refer to that at some point. But we have reached, I think, the minimum. There is nothing that's going to bring dog deaths down, dog bite-related deaths down below 10 or 20 a year. It's just not going to happen. We're going to end up with the law of unintended consequences. We're going to push here, and something else is going to happen here. We're going to go breed-specific, and other breeds are going to be, take over. We're going to lose, for example, the value that dogs provide to a household for domestic serenity and peace and all that, and end up with other problems. Uh, so I think that we need to look at the fact that we are probably at the lowest level that we're going to be able to get. Um, I can go on about this 
and we'll be pleased to do that if anyone wants to take me to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but maybe I could take just a couple of minutes of questions, Patty, if you can do that. And there was one that started over there, I think, a bit ago. Looking at these 400 dog deaths, the predominant dog deaths were, unre were from unrestrained dogs. A lot of them on property or so on their own property or off their own property, unrestrained dogs. But the restrained dogs, and there was a couple that were restrained dogs on their property that killed, but there was only one out of these 400 that was a restrained dog off its property that killed. And another, just to spin on something I said earlier, because I want to make sure this is uh, true, that the <coughs> spectrum of deaths is such that the majority of them occur after age 70 or less than age 10. Um, it's a very, very small percentage that is occurring in that middle group, so most of you are safe. First thing, first thing first, the AVMA task force concluded and has stated repeatedly that breed-specific legislation is ineffectual and has no value, and that that is not going to work. So you reduce it, if you will, to the bumper sticker, you know, punish the, the deed, not the breed. Um, the problem becomes that there are different dogs that physiologically behave somewhat differently and their bites are different. So many of the dogs that bite typically just kind of a grazing wound where I'm led to believe that other dogs with much more powerful jaws tend to hold on. I mean, these are dogs that hang on trees and other things, so they're very, very strong muscular animals. So the, the destruction they're capable of doing is great. I think that it's like it's like gun laws and everything else. It's the enforcement of things that ultimately are going to determine things. So an uh, unleashed animal is in violation of the law. But we don't have the incentive, it seems, to deal with that. You know, talked about the, sm the small number of dogs that are licensed, so how are you going to possibly start enforcing, if you will, a leash law in circumstances? So I don't. There's five factors at play, I believe, five factors at play that determine whether a dog, how a dog is going to react and whether a dog is going to bite. So there is heredity, there is early social, socialization, there is training and later socialization, if you will, there's health, injury, and all of that, and victim behavior, which is probably the only one that we can affect on a daily basis, routinely, in every place of work, pleasure, or business. Schools, everywhere. So it's that fifth factor, I think, that we need to be targeting a tremendous number of while the dog fanciers uh, look at the other four. <laughs>